Maddie was big in every way, except her physical size. There's two ways of being big, and that is to come into a room and suck the life out of it. She actually brought the room to life every time she walked into it. Well, as a child, she was exhausting. She, <laughs> she's always been a lot like me in that she's kind of an overabundant bundle of energy. Maddie was crazy. She was loud, as everyone likes to say but she also was one of the most caring people I'd ever met. She was super bubbly and touchy and outgoing, and I was a little bit more secluded and uh, more mature, and as the older sister, I kind of like took on that responsibility. Even though we were super different, we still had a really close relationship. Maddie was like always a ray of sunshine, honestly. Like she never failed to put a smile on my face to make me laugh and like I really appreciated that about her. I never had a bad time when I was hanging out with her. She was very much like the older sister that you could go to like anything with because she was very brutally honest and would speak her mind. She always knew what to say. The truth, even if you didn't want to hear it, you heard it. She was just always there for you no matter the circumstance. Maddie was just always moving and just very athletic and everything she tried, athletic-wise, she could do. We always knew that she had something in gymnastics. Not only did she love it so much and was so passionate about it, but she was good. My name is Jim Fredrickson. I am the owner of Jim Kinetics Gymnastics School here in Mokina. I'm also the head coach of our competitive program. When I started coaching her, she was probably here four days a week, three hours a day. And then as she moved up in level, I spent quite a bit more time with her, and we got really close as, you know, as a coach-gymnast relationship. She was always a kid that always cared about her team, though. Even when she was little, she was concerned with others probably more than herself, and she was just that kind of kid. She always worried about everybody. I was at work, and my friend from high school texted me and said, hey, are you and Maddie and your parents okay? And I said, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in New York right now, so I, I would assume so, why? And he said, well, my sister was driving home from school and she saw what looked like your car in a really bad accident. So it was about 2.30 in the afternoon. Maddie and two of her teammates had just gotten done with school. Maddie typically drove the two girls who were younger than her. I remember hearing Mad Dog scream and she swerved the car and that's when I realized we were like rolling. I got a call. Some woman, I never knew who this woman was, got on the phone and she said, I'm here, your daughter's been in a bad accident. I yelled to Frank and I hopped in my car and I just left. So I hopped in the car, I was not far behind her, I was parked in a parking lot. So I ran around the building and that's the first sign I saw of it and I had no idea if it was a small accident, big accident, and when I saw that it was a rollover and. The, the roof was caved in and as bad as it was and my knees buckled and I ran right to the ambulance. I peeked my head in and I saw the three girls sitting on a bench inside the, the ambulance and they were just sitting up and whew, talk about a relief, you just, you know, because you had, I had no idea what to expect. And then I saw her and she, I couldn't even see a, a scratch. Uh, the two other girls I think had a couple of scratches mm -hmm. and cuts that Maddie was you know, she was okay. She was okay, and that was, I mean, an incredible relief because if the car was just destroyed. Later, I FaceTimed Maddie, and I broke down. It really hit how lucky I was that she was still alive. One day, Frank and I were sitting in the living room, and she just said, hey, after that accident, she goes, I kind of realized, you know, if anything like that ever happens again, and the outcome isn't as good. She goes, I just wanted you guys to know that I want to be an organ donor. And I, I jumped in and I said, whoa, no, we're not having this conversation. No, we don't, we don't talk about this stuff. Yeah. But I am so grateful that we did and that she pushed on and said, no, you've got to know. Right. If anything like this were to ever happen again and the outcome 
wasn't as good. She said, I, I want you to have something good come from something tragic. And of course, after just, you know, rolling up on a car accident like that, I thought, wow, you know, okay, well, good for you. We're not going to have to worry about that, though, because that was enough of a scare for a lifetime. We're not going to have that happen again. This form commemorates my choice to attend the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. By signing this form, I embrace the Division Three philosophy. Her friend had just asked her, hey, we've got an extra ticket to the Shawn Mendes concert. Do you want to come? And she was like, oh my God, yes. She was so excited. That day, I mean, she got ready, it was a normal day. She went to practice that morning, she was fine. And then they were all going with Bella's mom and Bella's little sister and a couple of their other friends. So she just ran out the door. So I literally had texted her and I said, don't forget we've got Auntie Booga's retirement tomorrow. So, you know, don't get home too late. She said, yeah, no problem, mom. And then we got the call not even a half hour later that she had gone down. My mom just answered the phone and she seemed a little shaken up and they said you need to get up here now she's already coded twice and so yeah we gunned it we got up there as quick as we can they brought us in right away and when they found her she was unresponsive she was clutching her asthma inhaler on the bathroom floor they said they um, got her heart back beating again <clears throat> got her intubated and she crashed again on the um, the ambulance ride to the um, the hospital. While we were in that room, they came rushing in and said, she's crashing again. We waited and then they came in and said, you can come in. There's a separate room by that. We're working on her. And we walked in and I remember they, the first thing I remember, and I'm sure you do too, is they, they had her on her side and they rolled her over and her eyes were open. Yeah. And we looked in her eyes and... There was nothing in there. It was... It, 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 I think we both knew. We didn't <laughs> say it and we had hope. But we both knew, I think, then that it was different. She wasn't really there. I got a call from one of Maddie's teammates, Mom. She says Maddie was at a concert last night and had an asthma attack and she's in the hospital and it's not good. I hung up the phone and got in the car and went to the hospital. I didn't know what to expect at all, but as soon as I walked in the room, I pretty much did a 180 and had to walk out right away because she was hooked up to all kinds of things and she just didn't look like the Maddie that I've known for all those years. And it took a few minutes before I could walk back into the room and I guess deal with it. When they took us upstairs to the PICU, before I went in, they had me sit down with one of the, I believe it was a family care specialist who just kind of warned me, like, this is not gonna be easy to see and you need to kind of prepare yourself because she's not gonna look like herself right now. I walked in and it, yeah, it was, um, it was a lot. Cause I mean, she's, you know, laying in a bed, she's intubated, she's got wires everywhere. My mom pulled me into a side room and um, she sat me down and she told me, we don't know for sure yet, but she's probably not gonna make it. She's, we're pretty sure she's brain dead. Um, so that was like the first moment that I, I, I feel like I had kind of known, but that obviously was the, 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 the final like, oh yeah, this is happening right as they were finishing up the last part of the brain death test, they brought Frank and Sam and I and Jim in. And so we were able to be in there with her when they declared. After multiple tests and everything, we met with Shannon with Gift of Hope. We were really comfortable with her. It was just kind of an immediate, like almost a sigh of relief. I remember we met Shannon Wyatt and we had this immediate connection because she was she's just so compassionate and it wasn't like okay down to business here's the clipboard let's talk I was like tell me about Maddie 
They made the decision when it was time to meet with me and they came in the room and I remember Frank, Cindy, and Sam were all there and they obviously were devastated and crying. And I think this was like the first family that I met that I cried before I even like spoke to them. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure I introduced myself, but then we just sat at the table and just like sobbed the whole time. Usually when I speak with families, I ask them to tell me about their loved one first and they told me about her, and that's when they shared that she was in the vehicle accident, and it was a pretty significant one, and she told her parents, you know, if anything ever happens to me, donate anything and everything, because I want to help as many people as possible. They're grieving, they're devastated, and yet somehow they opened this like little trust door to trust this one person to let them come into their life, and they trust us to take care of their loved one. Um, so I think that's, my favorite part is just like seeing that crossover between the devastation to now, this is something that we wanna to do to honor our loved one and this is the person who's gonna help us get there. She's gotta to come to families at their absolute darkest moment and try to help them see that there's possible light in this situation. And you don't really wanna necessarily hear that at that time. There's so much hope in being able to donate your loved one's organs and tissues that really helps you get through that grieving process. Gift of Hope is the organization that procures organs for recipients for most of Illinois and Northwest Indiana. They are the organ procurement organization, the OPO. They were the ones that worked to get Maddie's organs placed. My name is Lisa Hinsdale. I'm the manager of organ operations at Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network. As the OPO, our role in organ donation is quite a few things. First and foremost, we are the ones who clinically manage the patient, who take care of the donor families, who talk to the donor families um, about organ and donation. We educate the public, we educate hospitals, public officials, et cetera, on organ and tissue transplant as well. Once we find out that the patient is eligible to be an organ donor, then my role is to go to the hospital and be ready to speak to a family, either after a family meeting, after someone's been declared brain dead, or the family's gonna withdraw life support. We work with the hospital after the hospital tries endlessly to save the person's life. If that does not happen, then we get introduced to the family to offer them the opportunity for organ and tissue donation. The organs that can be donated include the heart, the lungs, the liver, the pancreas, and the kidneys. An organ donor can certainly donate beyond solid organs, can also donate corneas, skin, bone, tissue. All of those are life-saving and life-enhancing organs. Maddie was able to donate both of her kidneys to two different recipients. She donated her heart and her liver to one recipient. Lungs went to asthma research. Both of her corneas, uh, ligaments and skin and bones have gone to so far nine different people uh, throughout the country. We're going down the checklist and they said, would you be willing to donate her heart? Check, yes. Would you be willing, liver, yes. Kidneys, yes. Tissue, yes. Corneas and eyes. Wait a minute. I paused, Cindy paused. We're like, why is this so hard? Right. But Shannon was great. She said, that's the one that gives a lot of people pause. That's where the life is. You look in somebody's eyes and you see the life. And that's what we remembered about Maddie, your big brown eyes. We actually had friends who were surprised that it was an open casket wake because she was a donor. We do have an interfaith council that is very familiar with all the different types of religions and cultural reasons why there might be some pushback and we consult with those people to be able to have better conversations with families. We can get someone of that same faith or religious background to come speak to them as well, why it's important and sometimes that will help them come to a better place too. I don't share with every family that I'm a living donor. I think I kind of feel like the ones that need to hear it, I'll share that. And it's typically like the ones that really struggle with, is this the right decision for our family? And that's when I can share with them that I'm a living donor and it was the best decision of my life.
living donation is typically someone who is related to the person that's in need of the transplant. Deceased donor would either be someone that was already declared brain dead or the family's going to withdraw life support. They have to pass away within 90 minutes typically in order to help other people because that's how long the organs can go without the oxygenation from the machines. The process of getting an organ transplant begins at getting on the transplant list. You must be identified to a transplant center who then begins the process of evaluation of a recipient. Organ allocation is really based on four different things, blood and tissue type because you have to make sure that the donor and the recipient are compatible with one another. Uh, geographic location, because the organs can only stay out of the body for a certain amount of time. Donor size is very important compared to recipient size. And then medical urgency is obviously the biggest factor in organ allocation. The donor blood comes in, the recipient's blood is also available at the organ procurement agency. We take the, the blood of both, we react them together to see if there's a reaction. If there's a reaction of the recipient against the donor, it means that the organ will not function properly because the recipient's body will reject that organ immediately. So we know that that patient can't get the organ, so we move on beyond that. For organ, you're transplanting not only the cell component, but it's the whole organ with a lot of different cell types. So the matching piece is very uh, important. We have another process called the cross match. That's when we do kind of the final confirmation that the donor and recipients are compatible. Opposed to the tissue side, the tissue, there's not really a matching per se. We just have to ensure that the the donated tissues are free of infectious diseases. Almost all the tissues that are used are decellularized tissues, so you don't need to have a match in blood type or anything like that. The allocation process is different and there's no matching like they do in the organ world. There's a lot of IT, really. There are extensive computer programs that really do all the matching. At the end of the day, there's an, a rank order of how we go about you know, distributing the organs. There's all these algorithms built into the system, and it takes all the donor information and the recipient information, does all these calculations behind the scenes, and then gives you a list of people in ranking order of who should get the organ offer first. There have been a lot of advancements in organ and tissue donation over the years. Now we have very good organ preservation solutions that allow us to assess organs. The ability, for instance, to pump kidneys, to put them on a little machine and pump some preservative through them to see if the kidneys are, are they really going to work? And then we actually transplant them and they go on to function for quite a long time. When I started at Gift of Hope 10 years ago, we had rule out criteria that we would never do now just because of the perfusion pumps. Every couple of years, huge new advancements come in in the organ donation field just because it's so new. I'm humbled to be a surgeon because what I do is just a very short piece. There is all the things that they've suffered in end organ failure up until the point that they get to needing to be on the transplant list. Then there's getting on the transplant list and waiting. Then there's the surgery. And while as a surgeon, everybody wants to know about the surgery, you know, where's the incision? How long am I gonna be in the hospital? Those kinds of things. In point of fact, I'm like, okay, I can tell you those things, but really it's the years afterwards that are, that are really, really important that you understand you will be seeing a doctor forever with any luck, because that's a good thing. That means things are working, we're tweaking, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're balancing out the side effects of the medicines with the good effects of the medicines. So all those kinds of things have to be taken into account. We hope that transplant is a lifelong, with the emphasis on the word long, um, process for a patient, for a recipient. Once the patient comes in post-transplant, it's one nurse with one patient and we monitor them closely. We make sure that everything is taken care of. They do require um, to be on um, immunosuppressions for the rest of their lives. The medication they need is to help them prevent from rejecting the organ. There are a lot of professionals involved 
in the process of organ transplant. Of course, just in the OPO, there are people who go out to the various hospitals that speak to the families. We have people that work in the call center that take in the calls for the referrals, and we have the people that do my job, but specifically for tissue, tissue recovery techs, you have transportation people. Dietitians, we have the infectious disease doctors. To the social workers and chaplains that help the donor family through their grief. The surgeons, the operating room staff, the nurses and the techs in the hospital that take care of the patients. So really, if you want to be involved in transplant, you can pretty much do almost anything and come be a part of our family. Everyone from all different walks of life and probably all different degrees can work here, but I think the most important thing is just having a passion for doing this work. The motivation that keeps me awake are knowing that someone is actually waiting at a hospital for the lab to finish up the testing so that they can get a transplant and get a safe transplant. It's not easy to convince people while they're living, it's like, oh, you should sign up on the donor registry because you're tying that to the death part, right? But it is important to recognize that for whatever reason, if an individual, you know, passes, there's still some ways to continue the legacy of it. I think anytime you talk about death, it turns into a little bit of an awkward conversation, but it's an important conversation to have. Everyone is going to die at some point and bring up that conversation with your parents so that they know what you would want to do so that they can look past their grief if something were to ever happen to you and make the decision that you would want to make is extremely important. So sit down, have that conversation with your parents and let them know that you want to be an organ and tissue donor and that you would want to help somebody if something happened to you. I think it's one of the first binding important decisions that a 16 year old is allowed to make about their own body. And I think it's important that that be a decision that they've come to after learning and understanding. But I think it's really important that uh, that 16 and 17 year olds know that they can take ownership of that decision and of what happens to their body should, God forbid, they be put in that position and that they should talk about that decision with their family members. because. Knowing Maddie's decision in those moments, it gave us some solace in knowing that we knew we were doing the right thing. We knew we were doing what she wanted, and that was really important to us. It was like the last gift we could give her. And so for teens to understand that, and to understand not only the importance of deciding to register, but then talking about that with their families is just is so critical. There's a lot of parents out there that maybe their kids want to be organ donors or tissue donors and the parents don't know about it. In Maddie's case, since she had the conversation with her parents, her parents knew that that's what she wanted. There's some parents that don't want to have to go through that process and it might be helpful for them to be able to go through that process if they knew that they were very passionate about helping somebody else. It would make it easier for those people to make those decisions that yes, let's move forward with that. Yes. You may have checked the box to be an organ donor when you signed up for your license or on the national registry, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your decision will be respected. Especially for minors, your family has the final decision on whether or not you're a donor. If your family doesn't know how important it is to you, if they hear, yeah, you're probably gonna have to spend a couple extra days here and it's gonna be a long process, they might say no. So it's so important to have the conversation about how important organ donation is to you because you want other people to respect your decision. About 96% of people are have a favorable opinion of organ and tissue donation, but somewhere between 50 and 58% and of people are actually registered. So somewhere in there, people are in favor of the idea of being an organ and tissue donor, but they don't actually go and take the step to register to be a donor. I hadn't thought a lot about organ and tissue donation before this all happened. After I realized that Maddie had this conversation with my parents about how important it is to her, it really stuck out to me how important that was for everyone else and that we needed to spread that message. We're gonna be able to make an impact on generations to come. Why wouldn't we want to save these lives? So it's just become very, very important to me, especially because it was important to her.
It was about two weeks after Shannon had called us that we received this letter from Gift to Hope. Dear Grobmeyer family, please accept our deepest sympathies on the recent passing of your child. The decision to give the gift of hope through donation are a lasting legacy and a testament to Madeline's beautiful spirit. Madeline saved three lives through organ donation. Her heart and liver went to a woman in her 30s. Her right kidney went to a woman in her 20s. Her left kidney went to a woman in her 70s. Madeline's left and right lungs were recovered for use in medical education and research and will help scientists unlock the complexities of disease processes and find life-saving cures in the future. We hope it brings you comfort to know that Madeline's eye tissue has provided the gift of sight to a child from Lansing, Michigan. We hope that you and your family will be comforted by your decision to help others and inspire compassion through eye donation. Thank you for making miracles possible. With warmest regards, your donor family services team knowing that it affected a child. There's so many more years and things that this child's gonna see because of that. And we've actually found out that the child was just two years old when she got the cornea transplant. That was the one thing that we paused on with Maddie was her eyes. It was good to know that, reaffirm that we made the right decision. My name is Jasmine. I am 26 years old and I live in Illinois. Before I received my biggest blessing, second chance at life. I had been on dialysis since February of 2014. I love to travel and hang out with my friends and family and being on dialysis three days a week took that away from me. I know you're probably still grieving from the loss of your loved one and I want you to know there's still a part of her out here living through me and I'm going to make sure I bless people just as she did me. I want you all to know that my kidney is working perfectly fine. My transplant team always tells me I'm doing better than the average transplant patient. It's been about a month since my transplant, and once I'm all healed up, I can start traveling again and hanging with my friends and family. I am truly blessed, and even if I could tell you thank you until infinity, that wouldn't be enough. Words can't describe how thankful I am. What you have given me will touch my family's soul forever. You all are very special people. Through your loss, you gave a young girl a second chance at life and being able to live my life as I want to. God bless Jasmine. It's important for a lot of the donors and recipients to connect post-transplant. Um, it's good for the recipients to have a connection to the donor family because they do um, experience a sense of guilt um, sometimes. And it's important for the donor family to know what happened and that their loved one is living on in someone. A lot of donor families are just so caring about how their recipients are. A lot of times they just want to know who their loved one helped save. It helps to know that she's still living out there in some way. The pure exuberance she had that she's going to live her life, you know, so much more in a more fulfilling but meaningful way now made a big difference because we know that's what Maddie would have done and it sounds like Jasmine wants to do the same. We give anything to have Maddie back but to know that she's living on a little bit in Jasmine is um, Jasmine's our, our daughter. <laughs> We wrote back to her, and we hope that maybe someday we'll get to meet. It's been nice to get to know a little bit about her, just back and forth over emails. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very healing for us. For donor families to meet their loved one's recipients is really amazing. It starts with both parties being ready and being in the same place in their journey. They can reach out to their loved one's recipients at any time. It is the most beautiful portion next step in a journey. It is sad, it is wonderful, it is breathtaking each and every single time. Hey Mr. and Mrs. Grobmeyer, it's Jasmine, the one who received a special blessing from Madeline. I'm so happy I'm able to be in touch with you all. I'm able to be working and keeping a job now because I always used to get sick and have to quit. Me and Maddie's kidney are working awesome. And then out of the clear blue in August, we received an email that just said, good morning, just checking in to let you know everything is good. How's everybody on your end? 
I have a hole in my heart that will never ever close. But every day that goes by, that hole gets a little smaller. It will never close, it will never completely heal, but it gets a little smaller every day because that's one day I'm closer to seeing you again. And I often think about when I see her again, what would she say about all this? And I think the answer would be, I don't think she'd say anything. I think she'd just give me one of those big mad dog hugs. And I'm cool with that.